I'm keen to talk to you in a bit about your about the food, your your partic in particular your snack uh, uh, production. But first of all, um, we're here in Switzerland, at the heart of Europe, not far from France, not far from Italy, not even very far from your native Spain. Um, so I wanted to ask you about a spot of uh, local difficulty you've been having with the grocery giant Carrefour. And they are saying that they aren't stocking uh, Pepsi products uh, because you're, the prices are too high, whereas you're, you're saying, no, no, we're not allowing them to stock it because we haven't reached agreement on a contract. Hmm. So I'm just wondering what, what's going on there. I would say um, this is a very normal practice. Not, not, the, the, what is unusual is that it's made it to the press. No? But <laughs> the fact that suppliers and customers uh, get into commercial tensions is, is just a fact of life. Um, in particular, in the European context, it's even tougher. I, I, I find the U.S. and, and the U.K. actually um, relationships much more win-win. So there, there's a much better collaboration with our customers in trying to build, uh, grow the pie, and then split the pie. Um, the relationship in, in particular in France and Germany is much more about splitting the pie mm -hmm. and that normally becomes more difficult, especially in circumstances like, like now where, where um, you know, we've, been, we've been having a lot of inflation and so on, on on both sides. So the reality is much more complex as you can imagine. We won't, we won't talk about it, but I'm not concerned. We, 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 we have very experienced people on the ground. We have people that can build win-win, and that's how we always approach these kind of relationships. I think that's how we build sustainable businesses. We're perceived our, from our customers normally as a company that delivers growth, and with growth comes um, you know, uh, profit for both. So it, it, is a, it is a situation that will, you know, will solve itself very, very quickly. But uh, do you, can you put a time limit on how long French are going to have to wait to eat Cheetos again? No, uh, you know, but they can eat Cheetos in many other customers. So we, we, we are about, uh, one of our principles is always everywhere. So we want our products to be in every moment of the day for consumers and everywhere where they can, they can, they can shop. You know? So um, rest assured that our consumers, um, and we have a lot of loyal consumers everywhere in Europe, they're finding our products. Since we're talking about pricing, what's your view on, there's obviously still a lot of talk around inflation, generally there's this feeling that inflation has been brought back under control, but there's still some underlying worry about it. What, as a retailer yeah. of, of your products, how do you see yeah. it? No, I think it, it's good for us, I think, in this topic to step back and, and, and like reflect what's happened to our businesses in the last four years. I think we, we've been through probably, and, and you know, I've been around for 30 years, as you were saying, in, in the company. I've never been through four years with this kind of um, you know, incredible uh, impact and disruption. You think about COVID, how we had to pivot our organizations to just um, you know, try to supply consumers yeah. and with half of the people at home, half of the people in the factories. It was, it was chaotic. Then once we kind of got back to that, then inflation as a consequence of that obviously took over. We had to absorb tens of billions of inflation in our company in two years. So this is, this is unusual. Uh, it's the first time we, we had to do that. We've done it with a lot of productivity in our business, but also we had to be smart about taking pricing. Um, um, in, in a very consumer-centric way as we, as we tend to do things. Now, the, the reality of what we're seeing now is that things are normalizing finally. So we're seeing supply chain stabilizing, we're seeing the labor market stabilizing, we're seeing many of the uh, large commodities starting to go back to a, a, a lower levels of inflation. Uh, not so much in agriculture, unfortunately. We're, we're seeing that agriculture is still inflationary for next year. Um, so we, we, and that's due to a, a lot of uh, bottlenecks in the agriculture industry. So we're seeing a moderation. And now I think we as company, but everybody in the industry uh, is thinking about, okay, now I have, I can run a better company. I can run a good company. I think we're all running suboptimal companies from many dimensions. So now the way I'm thinking about it is next year, I'm, I'm going to raise the bar on excellence across all, all our market units. I'm going to try to uh, optimize value equations. That probably had got a little bit off, off in, some, in some areas. I'm trying to dial up innovation. Obviously, innovation is our main source of growth. And we've kind of uh, slowed down innovation for a couple of years because supply chain wasn't ready for, for, for small things. So now innovation back at the center, brand investment, et cetera. So I think we're probably 
in the next 18 months, we will see an optimization of, the, uh, of all the organization and the cost structures, in the value equations, in the commercial plans, in the consumer plans, and that's, that's our core competence. Now, the truth is that this disrupted, uh, or disruptive four years that we had have made our companies, at least PepsiCo, much more resilient, much more agile, much more decentralized. So in our case, I can see our leaders in every market having a mindset that they didn't have four years, five years ago. They're much more end-to-end -end owners of the business. They are, um, they are more, much more agile. They see um, risk as an opportunity. When there is a problem, they, they immediately go into, okay, how do I quickly react and take advantage of that opportunity? So I think it's been a very positive mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, transition for, for, for us, for sure. And uh, we're going to keep those cultural and, and skills in our leaders because I think that we're going to need them. I don't think the world will, yeah. will be stable from now. Where do you see the sort of headwinds? I mean, are you at all affected by what's going on in the Red Sea at the moment? I mean, what are the things that worry you? No, not, not, uh, not so much uh, by, by, by this particular point that you were referring to. We are a very, we're a local for local business, right? So, I mean, and, and that might be a, an advantage for us. We grow, we grow potatoes, we grow corn, we grow uh, oats, we grow, um, you know, most of our crops, we grow them in the market. Uh, in every market, and we manufacture uh, in every market, and we sell in every market. So we're very local for local business. So we're isolated from uh, what are the trade disruptions that happen. Although obviously so we, we yeah. move some, we move some uh, some goods around. Um, but but obviously geopolitics is a concern. Geopolitics is a concern. It's it's something we're, you think about five years ago when we were thinking about our, our growth plans or our strategic plans. I would say geopolitics had less relevance. Mm -hmm. no, they were, we were not thinking about so much the geopolitics. We're thinking more about the consumer and the customer and, you know, and, and, and our associates, which are critical to us. Now we need to add other factors um, and, and just be, uh, you know, be aware that those could, you know, things that we thought would never happen are happening and uh, they will impact our growth strategies uh, probably long term. So you talked um, just now about innovation, so I wanted to sort of step back a bit and look at your broader strategy. So we reported um, last year that you were, your, your view is that the company, rather than trying to encourage um, different, more healthy snacks, it was to, to double down on what you're known for, which is uh, fundamentally soda and chips. And rather than trying to persuade people to, to choose healthier snacks, you'd make these snacks, the ones that people really want, healthier. So I wondered how that was going uh, for you, both in terms of yeah. sort of public health, but also as a strategy for the company. Yeah, it's like, like there's some misperceptions in what you're saying. I'm <laughs> but, I, you know, let me try to address them and, and, and just give you uh, the, the broader strategy. What, what, what um, We are, a, um, as I said, a, um, a food and beverage company, uh, actually a convenient food and beverage company. That's how we define ourselves. We play into large, very large categories. If you think about consumer... Uh, convenient foods is about a trillion dollar category, growing five to six percent globally, and beverages is also close to a trillion dollars, growing five to six percent. So these are very large, very fast growing categories that if you think about some of the macro trends that are happening in the world with urbanization, with new lifestyles to, to income households, with increased uh, disposable income in, 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 in emerging developing countries, those categories will continue to grow at very fast pace. So our, our, you know, I think we're very well positioned from that point of view. Now, how we participate in those categories, uh, we, I, I think our core capabilities, and no matter what happens with the consumer, will always be is we want to have we want to be the best at consumer insights, consumer intimacy, as we call it. So really understand consumers. We want to uh, build indispensable brands. We want to be very good at superior at R&D and product development, and then have omni-channel uh, execution um, superior to others. So those are the four things we want to be the best at. Mm. Now, if you think about what you were saying, the consumer is, is, is in a process of evolution, as has been for the last 100 years. So we, that's why it's so important that we're very good at consumer understanding. And through that consumer understanding, what we, what we 
what we learn, is that consumers are, are looking for different needs throughout the day, different occasions, and, and our mantra is we want to be always everywhere in consumer life, so always everywhere. Now, if you take always everywhere, what it means for us, we're going to have to continue evolving our portfolio, and there's four vectors that we, you know, we're very focused on our innovation. One is uh, permissibility, as you said, and I'll, I'll talk more about how we're approaching big changes to big things versus smaller things. So permissibility is one. Convenience is another one, which is, which is uh, you know, critical with lifestyles. The other one is functionality. Consumers want more, more functionality with their beverages and their, and their foods. And then taste. Taste is still the number one um, um, factor of choice, right? So those four vectors, and obviously, where the, 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 uh, the intersection of those four are the winning products. No? So we, we, we keep innovating against that. Now, what are the big spaces for us? One is evolving the portfolio and with those vectors. The other one is we, we want to move our uh, portfolio into meals. We think that the convergence between snacking and meals is more and more. Mm -hmm. We have the right to participate in meals, um, mini meals, convenient meals with our current products, but also other products. And we're, we're starting to um, include our, our products in recipes, in, in, in cooking, in culinary. And you will see more of that in home and away from home. The, um, uh, the other big uh, pillar for our growth strategy is make your own beverages. And I think the beverage industry is going to be disrupted or is going to be, you know, I don't know if it's disrupted or will create additional opportunities when we enable the consumer to make your own beverages. We're doing that through a couple of things. One is SodaStream. The SodaStream business will help us enable consumers to create their own drinks. We're adding our own brands to that ecosystem and, and it's throughout the day. And then we're, we're going very hard at uh, powders and tablets. If you think our, our largest beverage brand after Pepsi is Gatorade. Gatorade is, is, um, is growing in, in powders and tablets. And imagine the convenience, the personalization that we can create and, and the, um, you know, the great taste and functionality. Then for us, a huge growth opportunity is international. We have a $40 billion international business, which is larger than most of the uh, consumer companies out there, but it's still small compared to the opportunity that we have. So those are big vectors. Mm -hmm. Now, to your point on, on uh, are, are you deciding to improve your existing products or build new products? Both. That's Where we're creating a lot of smaller brands that you might not even know that are PepsiCo, um, to go to, to some, you know, I would say, uh, premium consumers that are looking for differentiation in in, in chickpeas or in rice or in you know some some lentils or plant-based, that's fine. We're creating those brands of the Eden Path. We're, we're creating a lot of uh, small brands. The real impact we have in consumer is when we are where we are transforming some of the bigger brands into healthier brands, uh, more permissible brands, and that is complex. And that is why I think it's a competitive advantage for us to have the best R and D in the industry. Because it's very difficult to make a, um, a great tasting lace with very low sodium mm -hmm. and with all, all natural colors and flavor. It, that's very complex. It is much easier to have a potato chips with a lot of sodium and artificial. And that is what's happening in the industry. We are able, and in many countries we have uh, lays already below WHO sodium standards and natural uh, yeah. colors and flavors. I think that's a huge impact in, the, in society. When you take a, a brand like uh, Pepsi, which had 11 grams of sugar, that was the average for the industry, not only for our brands, and now has seven or five grams, you're making a huge uh, impact in society. And consumers cannot tell the difference. Right, so that's that's the complexity of the R and D system. Having yeah. products that are very uh, great tasting and much less sugar in this case, uh, obviously zero sugar has been a great success, and that's a very complex. So, the more complex the products are, the better it is for us but because we can create advantage in with with our R and D. But that's, I mean, that's very interesting because there's a big um, 
you know, there's a, a big sort of movement at the moment against ultra-processed foods. Uh, there's clearly a lot of concern, and scientists and dietitians are beginning to make links between health and the extent yeah. to which a diet is ultra-processed. I mean, to, how much are you thinking about that, or how much are you worried about that? Because I imagine, yes. I mean, most of your mm. products would fall into the yeah, ultra-processed no. category. Uh, well, uh, to me, the ultra-processed debate is, is a is a continuation of everything we, you know, we had for 20 years about sodium and, and fat and sugar. Um, so it is just another, another chapter. It is much less scientifically defined, I must say. So um, I, I think public policy needs to do more work on that. However, the um, you know, um, ultra process to me has a risk that we vilify everything that is processed. If we want to feed the world, we cannot feed the world with fresh food. We, you know, it, it, there needs to be a certain level of, of uh, processing. And at the end of the day, that's what we do in our kitchens. Like the, the, the logic I'm using when, I, when we're briefing our innovation, our R&D teams, is like use kitchen logic. Use kitchen logic. Like we see our factories as very large kitchens. We cook food in our, in our, in our uh, plants, right? When, when I talk to um, our associates in the plant, they're running maybe a, a huge uh, uh, potato chips line. They say, I'm a cook. I'm cooking. They are proud of being cooks. Because if you think about what we do, we take a potato, we peel it, we put it through a fryer. And by the way, it's a much better fryer than anything we can do in our homes. Right? We control the oil temperature, we co control the oil quality, there's no acrylamide, it's always perfect versus when we cook at our house, it's different. So clearly, we're thinking about kitchen logic, so doing things that we do at home, like a Doritos. Like a Doritos is just corn that we take into the factory, we make it into a, a corn uh, mm -hmm. masa, and then we bake it. That's something we do in our house. So how many ingredients is there in a Dorito? Yeah, it depends. In an in a, in a, in a, uh, unflavored tortilla chips that you do for dipping, mm -hmm. It's corn and oil and a little bit of salt, right? Something like, so if you use the kitchen logic, I think we can probably bring a bit more logic to this ultra process because ultra process is everything. A, a, a tomato ketchup is ultra processed. Like we need this. A uh, 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 um, piece of bread is ultra processed. No, so I think, I think we need to bring some uh, logic to that debate and not vilify everything that is cooked, mm -hmm. or everything that is somehow processed to give us food safety, to give us long-term you know, products, go to rural areas, how do we bring food to rural areas? So th those, yeah. those elements. So I think we will eventually bring some uh, rationality to that debate. But of course, we're looking at this with the same lens as I was uh, saying earlier. We see it as a, as a potential risk, but we see it as a huge opportunity for us to bring R&D capabilities, to innovate, to move our products into spaces that uh, consumers would prefer. Yeah. So I wanted also to ask you about another p possible challenge to your business, which is the coming on board of weight loss drugs, which obviously, yeah, they're coming along, and there's been some predictions that this is going to radically change, in particular in the US, the, the food industry there, because the demand for snacks and the kind of many of the products that you make will simply go down. So I wonder, First of all, you know, how much of a challenge do you see weight yeah. loss drugs as being long, long term? And secondly, how are you responding to that yeah. challenge? Yeah, I think, I think it's, a, it's, a, it's a good, listen, it's, it's, a, it's a disruption that if, you know, if it materializes, it could help a lot of people's life, well-being. No? So I think from, from, the, uh, from the medical point of view, I think it's, it's great. Now, there's obviously we've been studying this, this development and there's a lot of question marks on, on speed and level of adoption and affordability and all that. So, I mean, we're, we're following this. The, um, the, with, with different levels of projection and, um, you know, with, with certain levels of certainty, we can say that even in, this will be a, a long-term impact, if any, and it will be very minor to our, to our organization because the portfolio has already hedges in itself, right? So we have products that will be a little bit impacted, products that will be um, positively. Um, so we have a lot of protein-based products, we have sports drinks, we have a lot of categories that, that, are, that are balancing each other. 
And the good news for us is I don't think it changes at all the strategy of the company. So if you think about all the vectors of innovation I was referring to, permissibility, functionality, uh, taste, convenience, that remains yeah. still actually, I think, I think we're in a, very good, in a good, very good place. I think we will have time to adopt in case this became, became a bit more of a, uh, an accelerated adoption. And um, so the, the only thing we're doing with R&D is, is you know, uh, trying to understand better the, um, you know, the, 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 uh, what happens to the consumers that are taking this, mm -hmm. these drugs as an opportunity for us to innovate in the needs of that consumer. Uh, and, and so we, we think this will be a, uh, um, you know, a, a reality, the same as, as some people are uh, refusing to buy a certain type of products, or uh, if you are in the dairy industry now is uh, uh, lactose intolerant. I mean, the industries go through these kind of uh, realities, and, and organizations evolve, and we have the uh, the R and D opportunities and 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 the the M and A opportunities if needed to to just uh, keep transforming our portfolio so that we remain a best in class and high performing companies as, as we as we want for our people and for our for our shareholders, obviously. So I'm, I'm always fascinated by how a big company like yours in the, in the food and drink space has different, different sort of um, products for different markets. And I think it's fair to say that a lot of the products in Europe have got, are already lower sodium, lower sugar. Is that because this is an intention that you want to roll out everywhere or is it simply in response to sort of government, no. government regulation? I think I think um, uh, it's a it's a fair observation. The, we're using Europe as a um, kind of leading uh, markets for a couple of things. For uh, as you said, innovation um, based on permissibility, um, and, and we're also using Europe for packaging innovation. I think those are two two areas where Europe, I think, is ahead of the rest of the world. In part, is the consumer is more advanced. I don't know if the consumer is more advanced because we're educated uh, since we're little kids of certain things, or if it's just re regulations are making us that way. I don't know what it is, but, but Europe is an ecosystem where the infrastructure for waste recycling is there, where consumers are more aware of certain trends, and where I think, actually, the governments are doing very pragmatic well thought legislation to evolve the portfolio. And I'll give you an example. In the UK, the, um, there, were, there was a sugar tax mm -hmm. uh, um, that was put in place, I don't know exactly, maybe eight or 10 years ago. And obviously the government worked with us, with all the industry to, what, what would be a pragmatic um, a taxation system that would help the industry to evolve, to have a, a, a healthier portfolio for consumers? Nine years later, 95% of the cola business in the UK, our cola business is non-sugar, right? And so it's been, to me, a great example of how uh, legislation can help uh, consumer evolution in a way that industries, you know, we will adopt. We, we, we adopt, we have good R&D, we have our Pepsi Max in, in, in the UK is a great product. It's loved by people and over time, legislation, in this case, a very pragmatic, well-thought legislation has helped us evolve the portfolio. Now this legislation is being adopted in many countries, right. and we are actually lobbying for this. Right. We're, we're not I, lobbying, but talking to the governments to say, this is a great way of evolving the industry, right? right? So, so you would choose to take, even without legislation, you would choose to uh, yes. take that product? Yeah. We, listen, we're, we're a company that, we're, we're, like, the way we're, we're thinking about our, ourselves, and, and Stephen is here as part of, as part of my team, we, we are, we're thinking about ourselves as a, we want to be a best-in-class and admire company. We want to be a best-in-class and admire company, and we want to do that in two elements. Obviously, financial performance and business performance, but also in terms of mm. impact. Yeah. So we think of ourselves as best in class and admire in, in financial and in impact. And impact is what you're saying. Like we want to make sure that our company, uh, and I think it's gonna impact the financial performance, we wanna be best for the planet and best for people. And that's why we, we created this framework called Pet Positive. Pet Positive is the way we wanna win in the marketplace long term. We think that without um, a, a, a big transformation on the way we do business from the way we source agriculture to the products that we sell, that we won't be able to be a best-in-class company on the performance side for a long term. So 
I, I, part of that is what we, a pillar that we call positive choices. Positive choices is evolving our portfolio to the trends that you were saying, lower salt, uh, uh, lower sugar, but also adding diverse ingredients. Diverse, like we made a commitment just a, uh, a month ago about we want to uh, have 100, I think it's 150 billion servings of diverse ingredients. The most important one, for example, is whole grains. If you look at the um, American diet, the most deficiency in the diet, in, in the American uh, diet, is fiber. Fiber. So consumers don't eat mm. enough fiber. So yes, one thing we're working on is a whole grain Doritos, <laughs> right? So take, taking Doritos, which is a huge brand in the U.S., massive brand, and making it whole grain, that would impact massively mm. the U.S. diet. Do you think they'll buy it? Given a choice, they will buy it if we don't talk about it, which is one of the, uh, <laughs> which is one of the challenges that we have as marketeers, as marketeers, and and you know if somebody has it, please let me know, and you know you guys can help me, but w if we talk about Pepsi reducing sugar, people don't buy Pepsi reduced sugar. If we talk about lace lower sodium, people don't buy lace lower sodium. If we talk about Doritos whole grain, people will not buy Doritos whole grain. And which is challenging. So we have to make all these transformations without, without telling consumers that this is a better product for them. That is a challenge, and I, I think it's, it's a pity, actually, because it would be much better if we could uh, you know, tell yeah. consumers this is a better uh, product for you, but it's as tasty. But they don't believe in it. They don't believe in it. So it's a challenge. So if anybody in the, in the room is a marketeer, that I, I love your advice how to do it because this is a million-dollar question for the food industry. You know, how do we make better products and talk about them and we create uh, consumer preference based on that? It's a bit like when you chop up vegetables and hide it in your kids' food without telling them the vegetables. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's, it's just... Uh, uh, it's, 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 it's just is so, there's so much perception. In so we, we've, we've only got five minutes left. I did quickly just want to ask you about plastic as well. You, 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 you're in trouble in New York with the Attorney General yeah. there over plastics. Uh, wh why is it proving so difficult to, get, to move away from single-use plastics? Yeah. Again, there, there's a consumer dimension to this. I mean, we're, we're, um, we're pushing Southern Stream ecosystem as much as we can. The adoption, the, 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 the number one country is Germany with adoption and it's only 12% of the families. So 12% of the households have soda stream and they're moved to a, a, a plastic free sort of consumption. Um, we, we keep working on it. We keep adding better flavors. We keep adding uh, things to the system. We're moving, as I said, to powders and, and, and tablets, which will eliminate plastic. Now, I, I, in many cases, it's infrastructure for recycling is lacking and the right uh, legislation to create that infrastructure is lacking. So uh, EPR, EPR, which is Extended Producer Responsibility uh, uh, Regulations, and we have it in Europe for many, many years, and I was you know, a little boy when I started here in Europe, and, and, and it's, it's, it's been a great success. Now we're trying to get that in the U.S., we're trying to get the U.S. to adopt a good EPR. Um, some countries like China, for example, don't even accept that we take bottles and we put them back into bottles, which is clearly a uh, you know uh, something we need to as an industry we need to convince the uh, the Chinese government. But those are the two largest uh, consumer consumer markets: China and the U.S. The U.S. lacks the infrastructure; China lacks the regulation. So we're working on this. This is a this is going to be a journey of consumer education, the industry clearly evolving, um, and in, in its in its solutions and making them uh, consumer friendly. Um, and but but we, we're all making progress. I think is one of the topics in Davos. There is a global uh, plastic treaty that is you know is being negotiated. Hopefully, we can find you know areas of common uh, agreement between all these different industries and different countries. And we have something that helps us uh, move forward, especially infrastructure for recycling. I think this is the biggest enabler uh, that will reduce plastic um, you know pollution uh, in the world. Yeah. Good. Well, I hope we've got time just for a couple of questions, maybe. Hello. Raymond, it's I good to see you. I India to see you. When I go in the interior of your village, it's in India. Hi, my name is Surendra. I'm in plastic recycling, by the way. But I have a different question. Uh, when I travel in India, where I come from, even in the interior of the villages, where it's difficult to reach out with petrols, we see your lays. 
<laughs> What's the secret that without increasing the marketing cost, you are able to provide there? That's always a fascinating to me. Yeah, uh, listen, as I said, one of our pillars and capabilities is this omni-channel perfect execution. So I think we are we're very local in India. We're, you know, again, it's an example of how we can become very local, have uh, you know, multiple uh, touch distribution system that reach the very rural uh, areas and with, with our products. There, there is also a, a knowledge in terms of making the portions that are affordable at five rupees to, uh, to some of the consumers in those areas. So there is an end-to-end -end, um, understanding of the consumers, how much they can pay, and then go back and say, okay, how do we build a business of this, you know, a, a full f a supply chain that allows us to sell at five rupees. Five rupees is, what is it now? Because it's been devalued. Is it uh, four cents, right? Something like that. So we can sell, you know, a bag of lace in India, in rural areas for four cents, and still make a decent the profitability for the distributors and, and for us. Um, so th these are, this is how companies like ours, the way I, I think about our company is we're a global company, but we're not really a global company. We are a, you know, a 200 local companies that are run uh, very locally for the cost structure of, the com of that country, for the consumer of that country, and, and then we're obviously enabling those local units to win in the marketplace with technology that is global, with uh, you know, with some capabilities that are global, with some uh, you know, some brand uh, strategies that are global, but but everything is is local. And unless we are very local, especially in our cost structures and go to market, we won't be able to uh, compete with you know with very agile Indian companies that you're familiar with. Um, yeah. So that, that's the reality. I think we're successful at, at at being a large global company that has a clear global vision, but then being very empowered in, in, in the marketplace and being localized. So that, so that's how we think about the business. Here we have another question. Hi, uh, my name is Sikandar Bizanjo. I'm part of Angro Corporation, which is a diversified conglomerate based out of Pakistan. Pakistan. Um, yes, I'm also a WF Global Shaper. Um, my question is on the geopolitics. Uh, for example, what's happening in the Middle East. Yeah. Brands like yours take the hit as well. How do companies like yours balance in these massive disruptions that are happening in the world? Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, we, we need to learn to live with these disruptions. And, and, um, and, and the Middle East is, as you said, a good example. And Pakistan is one of the markets where we're feeling a little bit of a backlash, especially in the Karachi area, uh, with, with our brands. And uh, it's something that will go uh, eventually. Uh, and, and the, um, you know, we, we, we're, we're so ingrained in countries like Pakistan. We treat our people so well. We are, we are, you know, we're Pakistan for Pakistan. Uh, yet we have some backlash, right? Uh, the same in Egypt, the same in other markets. I, I think this is the reality of global companies. We have to live through these kind of disruptions. Uh, luckily, the portfolio is very diversified, so we can, you know, we can navigate through these transitions. But, uh, you know, again, the philosophy we have. I'm sorry, the philosophy we have is to be local, to be a company that is very rooted in the communities in every part of Pakistan, we're, we're supporting the communities, we're trying to, uh, for the Pakistani consumers to believe that we are genuinely a company that brings value to Pakistan. And we do it through agriculture, we do it through creating incredible jobs that people have the opportunity to grow from, you know, the very basic of the, of the, uh, of the organization all the way to the top. Actually, our GM in Pakistan started from being a salesman. He's the GM of Pakistan. He's an incredible guy, you know, Furkan. So, you know, that's how we think about the business. And I think that long term, that would isolate ourselves from, you know, from being kind of pushed back by, by communities or by, by countries. Long term, I know um, this, this kind of uh, impacts in our brands will not last too long because we have this consumer loyalty and this community um, loyalty in a way. Yeah.